Aishan, I'm already such a big fan of your work, and I'm, I'm a huge fan I'm of yours too. To I'm so excited. To fear, I can find out even more. <laughs> welcome to Oxford. Welcome to the Skull World Forum. I think it's your first forum. It's my first forum, and I love it already. Everyone I've met here has been so brilliant and so warm. It's there are, been look at them. They're an absolutely lovely crowd. <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. <laughs> They're beaming at us. Um, so I wanted to start by, by asking what led you into the work. It's a classic question, but actually in your case, um, when I was reading you know, your biography, I was really struck by the fact you went straight into this work pretty much from university. I felt like even at university you were beginning to kind of conceptualize that this is where you wanted to kind of put your contribution. But what led the young 20, 21-year-old Aijan to have her imagination captured by domestic workers? Because it wasn't something that was popular or much talked about at the time. What, what led you to it? Well, I was raised by a long line of really strong, amazing women, starting from my grandmothers and my mother. And growing up as a child, I just thought they could do anything. And then growing up, watching just everywhere I went, women underrepresented in positions of power and decision making and overrepresented in positions of vulnerability and abuse. And so I just became interested in women's activism and understanding why things are the way that they are. And um, so I joined women's organizations, I became a women's studies major and started volunteering at different organizations to learn about how we change this unbelievable inequality that didn't make sense to me. But there's so many different directions that people can uh, go into when they're thinking about women's activism and gender inequality, but your domestic worker focus is, is very kind of razor clear. And as the conversation goes on, I think people are going to understand how foresighted actually you were 20 years ago to kind of locate yourself there. But it's a very specific um, demographic that you, that you saw and thought, wait, hang on, who is, you know, what are the issues going on here? Can you kind of speak to what you saw back then? Well, it, in New York City, um, there's a very large immigrant community in New York, and that's where I was. And I was volunteering at a domestic violence shelter for Asian immigrant women. And because my grandparents raised me, I, I'm bilingual and I speak Mandarin. And so I worked the hotline for the shelter. And many of the women who called were calling in crisis around abuse, but they were also calling in just the daily struggles of trying to make ends meet, working incredibly hard in low-wage service jobs and still unable to find housing, put food on the table for their children. And I just wondered how, when these women have overcome the odds and are working incredibly hard, is it that they still can't make ends meet? And that is just the case. There's so many occupations where women are working full time and more and still can't pay the bills. And then what I saw was women whose work was in the care industry, that this entire part of the economy is basically in the shadows and underground. And so in addition to low wages, there were no standards, no guidelines. It was like the Wild West because we as a society and as a culture and ultimately as an economy haven't accounted for the incredible amount of work that goes into caring for families. And the collateral damage is millions of women working without protections. So the first organization that you founded was very much New York based and you started, I think, you know, working at a city level and that ultimately became a kind of state level, but really focused on New York. Can you talk about what the work actually was um, in terms of the organizing that you were doing and also how it led to the policy changes that you managed to achieve? I mean, I really did not know. I was never professionally trained as an organizer or activist. I just kind of figured it out with other women along the way. And literally, you would have found me in the late 90s going from playground to playground in Central Park or in Riverside Park, talking to the nannies who were there with the children in the playgrounds and just listening to their stories and hearing about what they're worried about, what their hopes and dreams are and organizing meetings and trainings and kind of meeting by meeting, gathering by gathering, 
we started to build so that every single meeting there were more women and it, more diverse groups of women. And pretty soon asking the question, why is it that when we know the work that we do is so important, it's so undervalued? Why is it that we can't, if we're expected to take care of the families that we support, why can't we take care of our own families doing this work? And so that just started the question of, we should have rights, we should have rec um, recognition as real workers. And that led you to realizing that you needed more than just um, to kind of uh, raise the kind of consciousness or the or the awareness of rights of the of the women that you were working with, but actually you needed to have policy change. Yes, so in New York, we organized the first domestic worker convention in 2003 and had nannies and house cleaners and caregivers from all over the state gather and identify if they could rewrite the labor laws in the United States, what would that look like? So we had 250 women in small groups with simultaneous interpretation in seven languages actually hashing out and re reimagining labor law in New York State. And it was a seven-year campaign, but ultimately New York became the first state in the country to have a domestic worker bill of rights in 2010. <laughs> And New Mexico, just last week, New Mexico became the ninth state to pass legislation. And I feel like at that point you realized that you needed to be working on a national scale. In a way, you used New York perhaps as a kind of proof of concept to yourself um, about the work that you were doing. And at that point, you launched the organization that you're running now with this big national focus. The theme of this conference is Accelerating Possibility, and we've just heard from someone who uh, has been talking about, uh, about the future, and I feel like now that you have this national scope, you're also thinking about literally the future of the American labor force, and I wonder if you could kind of speak to how you see the role, the changing role of domestic workers in that future. I mean, we talked about it before, and I think it's just, it, it kind of, you, you blew me away with a perspective that was right in front of me, but somehow I hadn't grasped it, and I wonder if you could share that with us. Well, one of the things that's been so profound working with this workforce is that I often actually refer to domestic workers as the ultimate futurists because even though domestic workers have been working in the margins and in the shadows of our economy, they have really been on the front lines of so many of the major trends that are shaping our future in the United States and perhaps globally. Everything from trends in migration to really looking at the future of work. When I first started organizing domestic workers in 1998, the conditions that defined domestic work were somewhat uh, at the edges of the economy, almost exotic. Um, lack of control over hours, lack of a clear job description, no access to a safety net or any kind of benefits, no training, no job security. And now, when I look around at the American workforce, more and more workers are having that experience, being defined by that level of precarity. Um, Domestic workers were the first to actually alert us to the incredible age wave, the change in the generational demographic in the United States with the boomers aging into retirement at a rate of 10,000 people per day turning 70 in America and living longer than ever because of advances in health care. It was domestic workers who came to us and said, we need training in elder care so that we can support the growing older population and the families who are needing us in this way. And so if we look to the margins, we can find clues, indicators of what's to come, and we can also find incredible solutions. In some ways, our national movement was formed out of a, the failure of many civil society organizations, even the labor movement, um, and our democracy to really represent the interests of this workforce. And so in that exclusion has been an, an incredible amount of innovation. 
I mean, we just launched our very first uh, portable benefits platform for independent workers out of our innovation lab, where we're able to now provide benefits like disability insurance and paid time off to independent workers like domestic workers for the very first time. And when we fast forward, these trends, that, as you're saying, you know, the, the signals for these trends can be picked up at the margins and, and are and were picked up by these workers and by those who organized with them. But fast forwarding to 2030, we need to be ready for a, a different configuration of workforce, right? Absolutely. So many, many of us have been hearing about how the future of t the technology will shape the future of work in America. And we've been thinking a lot about automation and artificial intelligence. And there's a lot that's unknown about what the future will hold. But one thing we do know for sure is that there's going to be a huge need for elder care a huge need for childcare. These are jobs that are not outsourceable, right? And they won't be automated anytime soon. My colleague Pollock Shaw talks about the fact that there's a lab in Los Angeles that's been trying to develop a robot to fold a towel for 11 years and still been <laughs> unsuccessful. So I do believe that we are going to have humans, real people like you and me, caring for the growing older population. These will be a huge share of the jobs of the future. And in fact, many economists are predicting in the United States that by the year 2030, if you take child care and elder care jobs combined, it'll be the largest occupation in the entire US workforce. So we have got to make these jobs good jobs. And what an incredible opportunity to create a pathway to real economic security where one generation can do better than the next, just like we did with manufacturing jobs in the 20s and 30s. Used to be dangerous poverty wage jobs that a lot of immigrant women did, and we made them pathways to real security and prosperity for millions of families. We can do that again with these jobs. Bravo. And so we need to reimagine these jobs. And coming back to this theme of imagination and storytelling, I want to um, bring into the conversation the film Roma. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Who, who has seen Roma? Right. OK, everyone else who didn't put their hand up, you have to immediately uh, rush back after this and, and catch up with the rest of us. Can you please describe to me um, your feelings when you saw the film, and then I want to talk about the partnership that you've gone into with participant with the film. Yeah. Well, a little bit of context is that as a movement, our job is to put more power in the hands of more everyday people to shape the future. And there are many different kinds of power, and because of how disaggregated and isolated our workforce has been, we've had to be very creative about how we think about power and and how we build it. So there's political power, which is the more obvious form which we've been building, and it's enabled us to pass legislation in nine states. And there's economic power, which we're developing through work in our innovation lab. And then there's what we call narrative power, which we define as the ability to tell the story of why things are the way that they are in the world on your terms, essentially the power to define reality. And as a workforce that's almost defined by invisibility, to actually be able to seize upon and tell our own story, tell a story that humanizes um, and that gives texture and, and real human dignity to this workforce has been an essential part of our strategy. So when our partners at Participant Media called us and said, hey, there's this film Roma we think you might be interested in, we literally did a happy dance all across the country. Um, but, and participant media and the director, Alfonso Cuaron, actually invited myself and a domestic worker from Texas, one of our leaders, named Rosa San Luis, to the world premiere at the Venice Film Festival. Um, and so we got on a plane, and we were excited and quite nervous, actually, because we didn't know what it would be like. Like, what if we didn't like it? <laughs> um, but instead, it was the most extraordinary 
telling of an extraordinarily human story with a domestic worker, an indigenous domestic worker as a protagonist, and it was literally a gift from the heavens for us. And we've got a, a short trailer um, which just talks a little bit about the way that you're going to be working with the film. I think it's got a, a few a couple of um, moments from the film as well, so we'll, we'll play that now. <laughs> Everything that we do is, is going to convey a message. The idea manifested to tell the story of the real life person who the character of Cleo is based upon. Her name is Libo. When I saw the movie Roma, I saw myself. And as for coloring, this is what I do. This is my life. To see your own story reflected back on the big screen is a transformative experience. When she saved those kids as part of her job, it was risky, but she did it. I'm not ashamed to say that I am a caregiver because this is the job that makes all jobs possible, and this is a noble profession. Representation really matters. We have to change policy and politics, but we also have to change culture. You need to change hearts and minds before you can turn to policy. Especially hearts. Let's remember, when we talk about voiceless people, we're not talking about people who lack strength. Yes. Yes. We're not, so let's not be confused about this. We are talking about strong women. This film sparking a new wave of activism for a Bill of Rights on behalf of two million domestic workers. Roma offers us this opportunity to really shine a light on that. You're going to Los Angeles to attend an Oscar watch party. We're having our first major Oscar watch party. This was a party with a purpose. The very special guests here were domestic workers from around the country. Honoring and supporting one of the 70 million domestic workers in the world. As artists, our job is to look where others don't. This responsibility becomes much more important in times when we are being encouraged to look away. Muchas gracias, Alivo. Gracias, gracias, gracias. It's such a beautiful film and really where art meets social justice. Can you talk a little bit more about how you used the kind of moment that the, that the wave that the film has created and how by being involved early enough you were able to kind of craft a strategy which kind of rode the, rode the Roma wave, if you like. And also if you could speak about what colleagues have done in Mexico, that would be, that would be great too. Absolutely. Well, we have... Um, this incredible partnership with Participant Media and with the director, the filmmaker, Alfonso Cuaron, who really wanted the film to be a platform for the movement to build its power, its voice, and its impact. And that just became such an incredibly fertile ground for real impact in ways that we couldn't really have imagined. First, the first thing we did was actually put the film in front of thousands of domestic workers. So we actually screened the film early on for domestic workers in communities around the country and also for employers so that they could actually use the film to populate the narrative environment in their local communities and with the local media to tell the story, use Roma as an opportunity to tell the story of what it is like today in the United States for domestic workers and these relationships, what would support these relationships to be healthier, to be stronger, to spark a conversation in communities. 
And then we had this opportunity to work with Senator Harris and Congresswoman Jayapal to introduce the first national Bill of Rights for domestic workers. And we timed it so that the conversation and the announcement about national legislation would come out at around the same time that the film was being released so that the two could be talked about together. Um, and also at the same time, our portable benefits product, Alia, right, which is a technology platform that enables thousands of domestic workers, hopefully millions soon, to get access to benefits for the first time. We've launched that nationally after being in beta for a year um, and actually three years of development. We launched it nationally at also around the same time that Roma was released and um, the award season buzz was starting. And so all of this allowed us to not only change the narrative and spark an important conversation in communities, but also to start to pivot audiences towards real-world social impact in policy and in products and in actual market adoption of this important solution for benefits. So the platform is still a relatively, uh, relatively new in its, in its national launch. I know you you were piloting and kind of getting it ready to, to scale it um, for, I think, two or three years. Yeah. But it's quite relatively new in its national reach. What yeah. do you need to keep pushing forward with that? What kind of um, partners or other, um, you know, other help do you need with that? Well, we need people to sign up. <laughs> we need employers. If you employ a, a house cleaner in your home, the beautiful innovation here is it allows for house cleaners with multiple clients to all contribute in a prorated manner to benefits in a benefits account that the worker then gets to decide which type of benefits she wants to apply the money in her account towards. It's portable. It goes along with her. Um, and it's something that if we can actually scale it for domestic workers, it's unlimited in terms of the fields where lots of different um, types of workers are piecing together independent work, subcontracted work, to be able to give them access to benefits. So we need people to adopt it, to sign up. It's called Alia, um, and you can sign up at myalia.org. Great, thank you. And. Um with the little bit of time that we have less, I wanted us to pull back out to the bigger picture. Uh, when, we talked, um, when we talked before about this panel and the meaning of accelerating possibility, I really like what you had to say about the, the challenge that we now have about who, who leads and where power sits and, and the role of women in, in, in this work. The reflection really that you can bring from having been in this work for 20 years to this moment and to this question of the future. I wonder if you could just share a little bit about what we spoke about with all of them. Well, um, in the United States, we are in the most severe political crisis of generations. And um, when I think about accelerating possibility, the immediate image in my mind that, that comes to my mind is an image of all of the women who marched at the women's marches all of the women who have been organizing in their community, calling Congress to protect health care, running for office, um, voting in unprecedented numbers, women who are essentially accelerating possibility in the midst of the greatest crisis, uh, existential crisis in our democracy of generations. There's a, if you're from the United States, you might be familiar in the Southeast and in the Midwest, there's a weather phenomenon called a sunstorm. And it's when you have torrential rain and maybe even hail, but the sun is still shining through really brightly. And I often talk about what we're experiencing in the United States as a political sunstorm. And women are the sun in that we've been holding space, we've been showing up, we've been accelerating possibility in the midst of an incredible storm. And if you think about the way that we're showing up, if you were at one of the first women's marches, it was multi-generational, multi-racial, and women were holding signs about every issue under the sun. And there was room enough for all of it. We didn't have to choose. There wasn't a hierarchy. It was about human dignity and the future in the most holistic sense. And I, 
I trust women to keep accelerating possibility. Um, along with all of you in the room, I think we are all the sun in this incredibly tumultuous time in our world. Ajahn Pu, we're out of time. Thank you. Bravo. That's amazing. Beautiful. Thank you. Sure.